Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Kivlin, curator here at DIA. And it's great to see you all here on this beautiful day. Um, but we're honored uh, to be hosting um, the book launch for the extraordinary new book by James Meyer, The Art of the Return, Art of Return rather, The Sixties in Contemporary Culture, which I hope you've been able to see a copy of or even pick up. We also have time after this panel to do so. Um, a few things, just that we're not able to present this program without the Department of Cultural Affairs. And also to my colleagues, I want to thank them all for helping me organize this program. Uh, Maria Celli, Sally Hughes, Max Sinone, and Andre Avila um, for today's logistics. Without them, it wouldn't be possible. And um, I would also love to welcome our two acclaimed figures that are joining James today in conversation, artist Anmi Lee and author Jennifer Egan. It's such a pleasure to have you both joining us today. Thank you. And I'll just begin with some um, brief biographies uh, for everyone uh, in a part of the panel, and then we're going to jump right into the presentation by James. James Meyer is Curator of Modern Art at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and he is also the cultural and an academic advisor here at DIA Art Foundation. He was previously the Winship Distinguished Research Associate Professor of Art History at Emory University in Atlanta, and um, also the Deputy Director and Chief Curator here at DIA. Jennifer Egan is a journalist and author of several novels. I'm sure some people here in the crowd have read them. Um, and one short story collection. Her most recent novel, Manhattan Beach, um, was published in 2017 as a New York Times bestseller and was awarded the 2018 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. Her previous novel, A Visit from Good Goon Squad, 2010, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize, National Book Circle, Critics Circle Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. She has also frequently written for the New York Times Magazine and she is currently president of PEN America. Anmi Lee was born in Saigon, Republic of Vietnam, which is now Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, in 1960. Lee fled South Vietnam with her family in 1975, the final year of the war, eventually settling here in the United States as a political refugee. She received a Bachelor's of Applied Science, I just learned in biology, I believe, and a Master's in Science, oh, Master's of Science in Biology from Stanford, and a Master's of Fine Arts from Yale University. Since 1998, she has been affiliated with Bard College. She is a well-known photographer and an artist in other media, and she works at Bard, actually, in the Department of Photography. Her work has been exhibited at such venues as Dia Beacon and Beacon New York, as well as the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, Museum of Modern Arts, rather, Metro Metropolitan, and the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago. So please join me in first welcoming James, and then that will be followed by a panel with all three. Thank you again. Thank you, Kelly. Well, it's wonderful to be here and to see so many friends and people I'm fond of. I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled to be here. It's particularly fitting to uh, present this new book here at DIA, an institution that I'm very fond of. It's one of my homes. And uh, an institution that is founded in the period that my book returns to, and that has one of the great collections of the art of the 60s and 70s and is the great custodian of that period in a way. Um, and so I'm so happy to be at DIA, and I thank you, Jessica, and I thank you, Kelly, and all my friends at DIA for having us. Um, we have a special guest here in the audience this afternoon, and um, that is my mother, and she is Charlotte Meyer. <laughs> Many people have commented over the years how lucky I am to have had a mother like her, and it's true, this is, this book is the hardest thing I've done by far, and um, there were many times when I wasn't sure I could finish it. And my mother was always patiently supportive of the book, and I'm very grateful for that. And finally, I'm so uh, honored to have An Mi Lee and Jennifer Egan here. Um, they're two fantastic artists. And my book is a response to great writing and great art and performance, different media that I've seen that returns to the 60s and 70s. Uh, a critic is only as good as the work she or he is writing about, and I'm very grateful to have had your work to look at and read and teach. 
So I'm thrilled that you're here. So I'm going to talk for a few minutes about the book and how it came about. And then we're going to have a discussion with On Me and with Jennifer about their works. So many of you know I uh, wrote a few books about minimal art and wrote a dissertation on minimalism, became a specialist on this period, became a historian of the 60s, and um, had the opportunity when I was writing the dissertation in the 90s to meet many of the great artists and writers of the period, interview them, people like Donald Judd and Carl Andre and Anne Truitt, Nancy Holt, and others. And it was a more recent past when I began the project in the 90s. Uh, the 60s and 70s were much closer in temporally than they are now. And here I was meeting the personalities and the figures of that period um, and absorbing their memories, absorbing their history, and being a good art historian. And turning the recent past into history, using the past tense, writing a book in the third person, a kind of clear chronological diachronic third person narrative that told the story of the invention of minimalism from 1959 to 68. And I would go on and do many other projects on the period, uh, most recently a big exhibition on the history of the Dwan Gallery at the National Gallery from 59 to 71, also a chronological narrative of the history of a major gallery in Los Angeles and New York. But at the same time that I was writing that book and dissertation and book and everything that came out of it, I was very interested in why I was so interested in that period. And I was interested in contemporary art, and I was involved in writing about contemporary art and doing exhibitions. And I started to notice that several artists of my generation were exploring the same period, as were several scholars. Um, my generation of scholars uh, were writing on that period as well. And so an artist like Tom Burr, um, his work in American Garden that was done at the Sonsbake Show in 93 in Holland, and my first exhibition, which some people in this room actually went to, What Happened to the Institutional Critique at American Fine Arts, had a kind of afterthought, a kind of continuation of this work, um, a kind of non-site of the garden in Holland, displaced to New York, itself a reference back in a chain of vectored uh, works back to Robert Smithson, to the Smithson non-site, to the floating island work, the wonderful barge of work being brought around Manhattan, um, flora and fauna that was planted in Central Park by Olmsted, he puts into a barge, then Tom makes a piece in Holland that refers also to the gay history of that park, to cruising. It's in the shape of a triangle referring to the pink triangle to the Homo monument in Amsterdam. And then displacing that work in a miniature version for my exhibition in New York. I initially developed a notion of what I call the mobile site, the functional site, a notion of place that is vectored, one pointing to the next, that Tom's work very much generated. But at the same time, he was looking at Robert Smithson, and that interested me deeply. And I noticed that other artists were looking at Smithson, people like Renee Green and her brilliant multi-part piece, Partially Buried, um, a work that's about the partially buried woodshed of Robert Smithson that was made at Kent State in January of 1970. A work that, of course, uh, was made only 45 minutes from her hometown of Cleveland. And Renee uh, starts going back, making trips to Cleveland to visit her parents, filming her home, going to Kent State, filming, photographing Kent State, finding the woodshed, the site of the woodshed. She returns to Kent State, returns to the 70s, returns home. Even the rock uh, that looks like a rock on the tabletop is um, from the Smithson Foundation of the woodshed. It's concrete. It's a non-site of the woodshed, a map of Kent State, and then, of course, the books of James Michener, including his Kent State, What Happened and Why, published in 1971, the first major account of what happened at Kent. And of course, as Renee would suggest, as much of fiction as the fictional books he's known for, Hawaii and, and all those other fictions. So when he writes journalism, it's as much a fiction, as much a story of the 60s, and frankly, a negative story. He, he blames the, the student activists uh, for creating the riot that led them to get killed. 
He looks at the 60s as bad. Um, and the Smithson woodshed would itself become a monument to the students. It got that graffiti on the top of the lintel with the date of the shootings, May 4th, 1970. And of course, it also stand, came to stand as a kind of sepulchral for Smithson himself, the fact that Smithson only died three years later in a plane crash in uh, Texas in Amarillo in 1973. And so the question of Smithson's death, the death of the students, the woodshed, a work that's meant to fall apart because he put so many 20 tons of dirt on it until the central beam cracked to demonstrate the principle of entropy, all start to blend together. And this is what Renee Green was sorting out in her work. She's also thinking about the culture of the period, the music of the period, Sly and the Family Stone, the Jackson Five, all this music that she was listening to as a child. And she reconstructs the set of the film Underground, the film about the weathermen that was made by Emile D'Antonio and Haskell Wexler in 75. The set of, of that film, you can only see the weathermen in mirror reflections. You can never see their faces because they're underground. They're fugitives in 1975. And then, of course, films about her returning to the place, her at the site of the woodshed. And works, of course, by Sam Durant, the two dirt piles, one of which has the sound of the Woodstock concert, everything's going wonderful, wavy gravy, he's handing out food, and we're going to give everybody steak and eggs, and it's, it's wonderful. And on the other hand, Altamont, the rock concert, also uh, from 69, 50 years ago, that winter, when Mick Jagger is saying, why are we fighting? Why Rolling Stones? Why are you beating up everyone in the audience? Why is somebody about to get killed, as, as a young person was at Altamont? So the good 60s and the bad 60s start to emerge as topoi in, in, in looking at the work of Durant. The woodshed knew and the woodshed decayed. Or an artist like Mike Nelson, actually reconstructing the woodshed in Oxford, England, three-quarter scale, putting oil barrels inside with the terms Texaco and Exxon, burying the woodshed in sand. It's 2004, we're in the middle of the Iraq war, and he's thinking about the United Kingdom's participation in that war. So the way the woodshed starts to take on a life of its own, an afterlife, an after effect, it returns and it can be um, re-semanticized to speak about the Iraq war and to make analogies between Iraq and Vietnam between the 70s and the 2000s. And then finally, my own obsession with Robert Smithson, my own obsession with Eva Hess, with Matta Clark, with, with all of these fantastic artists of the period, um, who died young and who I was not able to meet. And of course, all the figures of that period who die young, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and so on. And the romantic topos of the artist who dies young is somehow imbricated with that period. And here I am uh, meeting Nancy Holt, the uh, spouse of Robert Smithson. And if you read my book, part two of the book, which all of this becomes, it begins with, with Nancy and myself, and it ends with Nancy and myself. And so I enter the story of 60's return in the book, as you'll see. So this book required a different set of, of terms to talk about this issue, a different kind of writing. It couldn't be art history anymore because I'm dealing with the effect of one period on another. It couldn't even be art criticism because the more I pursued this question, the more I saw that fiction and memoir and all kinds of media, reenactment performance were involved. And so I proposed this idea of the return of the 60s the return of is how one period affects another, how it returns in the present. I'm hardly the first person to think about this. There's Nietzsche, there's Walter Benjamin, there's many, many great thinkers who have pursued the question of historical return, seeing history as dynamic, as a force, that it's not static, that it's going to bleed into another time or return from the past and make a connection into the present. Walter Benjamin would call that the constellation. Versus 
or the return to. So what that means to me is the going back, the individual act of return, the, the act of returning either to uh, mnemonically to a time that you're remembering or a place of memory. Return can be both mnemonic or as Renee Green shows us, a return to a place. And an artist like Harry Marshall um, making works about the civil rights era, the memory of that era today, how memory affects us, the, the angel of mourning, mourning all the martyrs of the 60s, the four girls shot in Birmingham, the three civil rights workers, photographing himself in a mirror with pictures of the Kennedys, the girls, all these 60s martyrs and the, the weight of that memory. Or on me going to Vietnam in the 90s, uh, and we'll hear more about this, country from which she was exiled, where she grew up, um, and photographing these beautiful landscapes, Mekong Delta, which of course, think about the Mekong Delta, we think about the war, but not necessarily for on me. Or Sante, a village, uh, to me it looks like a, a, a Van Gogh from 1890, an Auvers Van Gogh, high horizon line little village, which of course, in my research I discovered was the site of a prisoner of war camp where American soldiers were put. Or this terrific picture of, of the former Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, people flying kites, but you can't help but think about bombers. Or an artist like Zarina Bimji, who goes back to Uganda from where she's exiled as a 12-year-old because she's a South Asian descent. And Idi Amin, as we know, forced the South Asian population who had been there since the teens and 20s um, out of Uganda in 1972. And going back from uh, London and going back and filming this place, returning to the place where she grew up from which she was exiled. And so you're seeing that the, 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 the account grew. It became increasingly international and global. Africa, um, Vietnam, Germany, the United States. I also come up with the notion of what I call 60s topographies. These different temporal constructions of the period and the work they do, the stories they tell, the narratives they create, the decadal 60s, 60 to 69, which Carrie James paints in, in this painting here. Beginning perhaps with uh, this moment on the left, um, and perhaps ending 50 years ago in 69, um, with all sorts of events, the Stonewall Rebellion uh, 50 years ago, the moon landing, the Manson, La Bianca murders, tape murders, um, Woodstock, Altamont, the end of the 60s, as a decadal construction. And, you know, even a show like Mad Men is a decadal narrative. It's a decadal narrative of the period. It really begins in 60 and ends in 69. And, of course, they meticulously reconstruct the, the close of that period to construct this. And this decadal 60s, I argue, is a particularly American 60s. It has a particularly American inflection. Then the year 68 as this kind of synecdoche for the whole. It's the culminating year of revolutions around the world, activities all over the world. And somehow 68 comes to stand for everything that we think of as the 60s. And I'm interested in that, how 68 is a synecdoche for the whole. And then the long 60s, for me the most useful, beginning perhaps somewhere in the mid 50s with Brown versus the Board of Education, the, the lynching of Emmett Till, ending sometime in the mid and the late 70s, German autumn in Berlin, the death of Mao, the fall of Saigon in 75. Most of the practices I write about are somehow um, from the long 60s. So the two 60s that I kind of understood looking at that Sam Durant, those two dirt piles, the good and the bad, these constructions of the period as both positive and negative, um, depending on your point of view. Um, Bill Clinton remarked that if you think the 60s was good, you're probably a Democrat, and if you think it was bad, you're probably a Republican. 
And the good 60s is utopic, it's idealistic, it seems so wonderful, everyone's getting along, we're at the Bean in Golden Gate Park, it's halcyon, it's heavenly, it's utopic, it's communitarian. And the bad 60s, violent, entropic, dark. Woodstock and Altamont. And the question of entropy, of Smithson's famous notion of entropy, um, dilates larger in the book to think about social entropy, about social breakdown, particularly in the United States, and Kent State being, of course, this culminating culmination of the bad 60s of social entropy. Everyone circling around the White House and hating Nixon and Nixon going crazy. Um, there's something kind of uh, uh, particularly American, perhaps, about that entropic 60s, too. And personal entropy, how, how death becomes a great figure of the period in the figure of Smithson and Hess and so many others. Now, one reason this book was hard to figure out it's not art history, as I said, so you're not dealing with a history that's over. You're not dealing with the Victorian period or the Renaissance. You're dealing with a period that a lot of us remember, whether we were active then, whether we were children then, whether we missed it and were absorbing it secondhand through narratives, through television, through media. So it's somehow a recent or not so recent past and it's somehow between history, memory, and nostalgia. So those are the three optics of return, history, memory, and nostalgia that I explore throughout the book and we'll probably be talking about with Ami and Jennifer who explore these issues. And my book is anti-nostalgic. Um, there's a whole chapter called Against Nostalgia. Of course, it took nostalgia to write the book. I was driven by my own longing for what I missed. On the other hand, the practices that interest me that I write about are very invested in a kind of anti-nostalgic or critical approach to longing for a period that you missed. And ultimately, you could say, end up on the side of memory and history. And uh, a book like The Flamethrowers by Rachel Kushner writes about Soho in the 70s. Somebody of my generation might think, oh, it was so wonderful, there's Mata Clark and he's slicing houses and, and, you know, I could have met Smithson and, well, Rachel Kushner's Flamethrowers depicts a Soho that's deeply sexist in which the main protagonist, a female artist, gets nowhere in the art world. Or a work by Seth Price, his... Uh, Diddle video effects spills where he takes a tape that Joan Jonas shot in 1970 and he turns it on its side and puts it in a shipping box and he takes a kind of digital technique and squeegees things and you realize by looking at these images that Nancy Holt was silent during the whole tape and Joan Jonas is silent during the whole tape. It's only Robert Smithson, Richard Serra and the dealer Joseph Hellman talking the whole time about site specificity. <laughs> so, uh, The Invisible Circus, the novel by Jennifer, her first novel, um, very much explores the question of nostalgia and memory, and we'll be talking about that. Um, it a, plays a big role in my discussion of nostalgia and anti-nostalgia. 60s children, so, so and you could say this book is an account of late or post-boomer aesthetics or sensibility. It's about people who missed the 60s and who are longing or nostalgic or invested in a period they missed, we missed, that we've heard a lot about but we missed. And you don't have to literally be born in the long 60s to be a product of that time. Uh, I just presented this material to undergraduates and, and, and they feel they're as invested in it as, as we are, that they're children of, of my generation and they just feel very connected to that period. So for them, it's a very imaginative and discursive relation. So works by Kerry Marshall about his childhood in Watts, Luke Fowler, his uh, wonderful installation, Pilgrimage from Scattered Points about the Scratch Orchestra 
Anarchic musicians in England in 1970 and 71, where children were dragged around by their parents and were allowed to be part of the group, of the ensemble. So to be a child of that period is to grow up with all these images, these powerful images that get replayed even now on television, uh, in media. And to always wonder, well, so it's, so Watergate, so where are we at today? Watergate is the constant reference today for reasons we understand. Now, to what extent that's a 60s or 70s return, or to what extent it's that we have another president who's, um, you know, mendacious and unscrupulous, and that invokes the reference to Nixon, we can debate. Uh, but somehow this period just kept coming back, and it comes back differently in different times. So Iraq, Vietnam was the mid-2000s. Right now it's sort of about Nixon. So th this kind of opportunistic return um, with, you know, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, they're always on TV, and, <laughs> you know, wasn't that a while ago? Why are we over that? Um, and judging the 60s, so... Um, the question of the parents, the children judging the parents, Henri Sola uh, judging his mother who was very involved in the Communist Party in Albania in the 70s in his beautiful first work in Dervista. Felix Gemelin, his reenactment of um, a flag run through West Berlin with a Maoist red flag that his father participated in in 68, reenacting it with his students in 2002 in Stockholm. Mark Tribe reenacting 60 speeches, 70 speeches, the same SDS speech reenacted um, at the site where it was given by Paul Potter. Um, the first major anti war march was in April of 65. Or reenacting Stokely Carmichael's speech in front of the UN and filming it twice with different actors. And I'm very interested in this notion of doubling. Um, Reenactment as a doubling of the original event, what I call temporal doubling, and that became very explicit to me when I came to this performance, and it was, it was a double of a double. John Malpede's reconstruction of Robert Kennedy's poverty tour in Kentucky to coal mines of Kentucky, fantastic reenactment. Mary Kelly reenacting a feminist march from 1970 with her students. She had been in the first feminist march, reenacting it in 2007 with her students and turning it into a palimpsest of these two events. And of course, my photo of the march on Washington with a young person saying, feminism is back by popular demand. So the whole status of feminism, its return, its future, is raised by Mary's piece. And On Me, the second series we'll look at by On Me, her Small Wars series, which came after her Vietnam series, which she'll talk about, reenactments of Vietnam War um, battles. And finally, myself. So I am in the story. The different kind of writing involved my own narrative. And if you read the book, it starts when I'm a child and it ends when I'm, alas, middle-aged, at the March on Washington anniversary in 2013. But my own return to Kent State, which I saw on television in 1970 as a child and didn't understand what it was, and I write a lot about, I recover my own child's relationship to Kent State. I consult my memories, the memories that, as I write, stick, that don't go away. And I go back to Kent State, and I walk that place. I reconstruct, based on reading Michener and looking at Renee Green's work and all sorts of accounts, I reconstruct what happened at Kent State for myself. I return to Kent State, a place I've been and, of course, had never been. And take photographs of the modernist statue by Donald Drum that was in the line of the bullets, the, Protesters were in the parking lot, and the, the guardsmen were right behind where we're standing. And talk about the graffiti uh, on this statue. I returned there, of course, at the height of the Iraq War in about 08. So analogies between Iraq 
and Vietnam are made. And I photographed the bullet hole. That was used as evidence of what happened, the bullet hole that went through uh, that statue, that sculpture. And so what I describe is how I saw this on TV and I remembered this photo and I returned to the place where Jeffrey Miller was shot and where he fell and I'm standing there. So I've returned. So that's a little introduction to some of the ideas in the book. And I would now really appreciate uh, being joined by Jennifer and on me. So one of the nice things about working on contemporary practice, unlike my Renaissance colleagues, I can actually ask the artists and writers about their work. And um, I'd like to start by asking Jennifer and on me about the Invisible Circus, about your Vietnam and Small War series. How did you come to make them? You made them early in your careers. And how do we look at them now? How do you look at them now? Um, well, I, you know, in a certain way, I never quite know the answer to that question, but I grew up in San Francisco in the 70s, and my, I moved there actually in 69, so I was sort of dimly aware of the counterculture as something that I might kind of see out the window, but my family had absolutely nothing to do with that. You know, my, my mother had, you know, I was by then uh, six. Um, I had a younger brother, you know, my stepfather was working hard, so there was no sense of our being involved with that. But then, you know, by the time I was a high school student, or even sort of approaching high school in the 70s, I had become pretty convinced that, the, you know, I was the victim of the worst case of bad timing ever. And that, you know, this was just a catastrophe that I had not been part of that period. And so I and my cohort really sort of longed for it and in certain ways tried to kind of reenact it, honestly, having never done it in the first place. For example, I went barefoot all the time in a, in a city. I would walk around barefoot all day long. And my feet looked like shoes. Um, and, you know, we, we took acid, we smoked pot, and the, the, the kind of... The thing we were sort of craving was that sense of, of union with that earlier time in some way. Um, so I think I had sort of, you know, th that's really where it starts. Um, but then in terms of sort of how the book actually came to be, I think that there were a bunch of other ideas that had come to really interest me that sort of intersected with that kind of feeling of nostalgia in that time and place. And I guess really central, probably the central idea was really mass media and, and how that, how the, the televising of the Vietnam War and the arrival of mass media as we know it um, interlocked with that period. And I was very influenced by a book called The Whole World is Watching by Todd Gitlin, who really sort of lays out an argument for the ways in which um, SDS and kind of student um, political movements were impacted somewhat negatively by mass media representation of their activities, um, unable to decode the distortions of media in the way that I think we're somewhat better at, although the distortions keep get changing to elude our our corrective <laughs> lenses. Um, and so I guess in the end, you talk about the good 60s and the bad 60s, I was very interested in how those two coexisted or whether one became the other and why. Um, you know, how is it that, that drug experience, which really was a kind of search for transcendence on the face of it, how is it that that so often led to addiction, for example? You know, Emmett Grogan, who was one of the founder of the Diggers, and you write a lot about the Diggers in the book, um, was kind of a fascinating figure, and he wrote a memoir called Ringo Livio about his growing up in New York and then going to San Francisco and the counterculture. He died on a subway train of a heroin overdose in the 70s. So there are a lot of these stories, obviously. Uh, and then the other side of that is the way in which um, political activism inspired by um, anti-war feeling 
resulted in, in many different countries, including America, violent underground movements. You know, how do you get from one to the other? Those were the questions I wanted to explore. Well, for me, it all started um, in graduate school. I um, come from a background of um, studies in biology, and um, I was going to go to, grad, uh, to medical school and somehow took a turn and uh, became a photographer. Um, so I, I, I did go to graduate school in photography and it was very important for me because uh, uh, it was such an incredible gateway to, uh, to the art world and to the art community. Um, so the big question for me in graduate school was, you know, uh, you should make work that's more autobiographical. and. Uh, um, I struggled a lot with that notion, what does it mean? Um, I came with this work that had to do with Europe and the craftsmen and uh, studios and sculptures. And uh, I didn't think I had such an interesting life. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, for many children who've lived through trauma, there's always something more traumatic than your own experience. And, and that's the way I looked at it. Um, but um, upon graduation from, um, from school, um, Clinton normalized relations with Vietnam, and suddenly the possibility of being able to return uh, was there, and, and I knew that uh, that's where I should be. Um, I wasn't sure what I would do, but I knew that I had to go. Um, I, I think that uh, something that I struggled with growing up was uh, this kind of childhood I could have had if there had not been a war, or the ability of knowing what it was like to grow up in the north of Vietnam, for example, which is where my um, mother's family is from, what it would have been like to, to grow up in a, a, a peaceful northern Vietnam. Um, and, and suddenly I would be able to explore that. So I think I was driven by memories of a kind of shortened childhood I had in the southern part of Vietnam. I was driven by stories I heard from my, uh, my mom, my grandmother. Um, and of course, when you live in exile, you know, your memory or any kind of memory is very faulty, you know, so you, you emphasize certain things, you forget other things, uh, so it's not quite reliable, but I think that uh, all those things kind of gave me an excuse to go to Vietnam and explore. Um, I was not a landscape photographer and suddenly somehow um, it made sense to me and uh, I understood the notion of scale. I understood uh, what it was like to photograph people doing things in the landscape, and it was so resonant. And I think partly because um, even though, I think James mentioned it, I kept talking about how I wanted to do something that had nothing to do with war. You know, war is very present. Um, I think photographing everything and letting everything into the picture allowed for a kind of maximalist uh, view of Vietnam. Um, embracing, you know, the old culture, this incredible history um, that has to do with war, but that also has to do with peace. Uh, I sort of let everything in, and, and, and maybe it had to do some, with some kind of um, psychological, or psychoanalysis, you know, it's like free associating. You know, you see something and it made sense, it reminded you of this and you saw something else. And it was uh, about letting all of that in and making pictures that are complicated you know, within the picture and from picture to picture. Could we actually put up um, on these photos? So it's interesting that, that James also mentioned the history behind the Sok Son, uh, the Sun Tay picture. Um, of course, you know, Vietnam is very small, so wherever you go, there would have been some kind of historical connection to war and violence. Uh, and um, there's no denial about it. But I, I think that I was interested in working with the present, but also letting the history and the past uh, steep in and seep in. You've said, um, I'm just quoting something that you said. You said, your photos could be as much about my memory of GIs walking down Todo Street in Saigon, which you witnessed, as an echo of the depiction of the air cavalry machos in Apocalypse Now. Um, so, like Jennifer, you're very interested in mass media representations and fictionalizations of that period, of that war, which you also experienced yourself. I think that's rather interesting. Yes, uh, you know, 
Because um, the war was so devastating everywhere in Vietnam that um, my childhood was pretty limited to living in Saigon and perhaps, you know, a quick jaunt to the beach, which is two hours away. Um, and so I experienced a lot of the, of the war through the media. And I remember pictures of um, GIs being airlifted and the wind and the rice fields. And, but I didn't really know what the Delta of the Mekong looked like besides just driving quick, uh, quickly through. Um, I did experience Tate 68 because we lived in the area that was close to uh, the American embassy. Um, but so um, my experience of the war was through the media, through the same movies that you grew up watching, through the same novels as well. And so coming home uh, was almost like uh, discovering a foreign country. But of course, uh, you know, the sense of the wind and the helicopters, all of that came together actually for me in, in that picture. And I can't say that I completely uh, uh, thought out and analyzed the picture, but, but you know, the immediate association for me was the nuclear of the family and then all that wind and, and the blowing uh, rice fields and the helicopters. Um. You know, the whole question of generation is raised in the book, and I argue that generations are local, and that for you to actually be in Vietnam, with the Tet Offensive happening around you, and you talk about that the Viet Cong occupied a radio station behind, in your backyard, um, whereas somebody like me, or perhaps you, seeing the war on TV, on a, in my case, a black and white TV, and seeing the body counts on Walter Cronkite, night after night, Viet Cong flag, American flag, um, we're both experiencing that war and that moment at the same time, but yet we're located so differently. And yet you're saying that your experience is as mediated as ours. Um, yeah, it, it's fascinating um, how um, we have real experiences and then we also have these um, mediated experiences. But I think the way I practice photography, which is pretty conventional, it's about being there, experiencing something and, and uh, seeing something and uh, unraveling something and try to bring it back. And so uh, location is very important and being there um, is important for me. Um, and so I think everything else is just uh, an excuse to go to the place. One thing that struck me is that for both of you, these were your first major projects. You had written, I think, a book of stories, Jennifer. No, not even that. The Emerald City was after? After. Okay, so it's literally your first project is that novel. And I think you told me you're actually starting to write it in the 80s. Um, and it's published in 95, maybe? Yeah. So it's your... It's really an early project. You're much closer temporally to that time when you're grappling with that time. I also am struck by how your novel is set in around 78. And yet in 78, there's already this nostalgia for 68. Um, a very recent, recent past is the figure or object of nostalgic longing in the book. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering, how do you look at that book now? I mean, from the vantage of now, your first book and well, it's a little different from, you know, the, the visual arts in that it would take a lot of effort for me to really know what I think about that book. I would have to read it, <laughs> um, which I have no intention of doing. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I, I would probably feel very critical of it, um, which is another reason not to read it. However, it sort of, I guess the, the way I think about it in terms of my own career is actually that it was the genesis of really everything that has continued to interest me. Um, I mean, I feel like one of the main stories I've witnessed in my lifetime is the, the increased proportion of our experience that is mediated. Um, and I think about the fact that from the time that I was born until I went to college, there was no telecommunications development that I was aware of. Like you made a telephone call and it either rang and rang and rang or you got a busy signal or someone answered it. That was the case when I was a, a little kid and that was the case when I went to college. And that is so hard. I mean, when I told my younger son that when he was littler, his first question was, was there electricity? <laughs> So that's so hard for us to really conceive of. Um, so that those developments, the ways in which mediation interact with our inner lives, our views of ourselves and our 
um, and the ways in which mediation and memory intertwine are my obsession. And, and specifically, I've been interested, starting with the Invisible Circus, in modern terrorism and the way in which it is an epiphenomenon of image culture. It's, it's a matter of taking a relatively small act, deadly and horrible though it may be, and seeing it reverberate through mass media. That's, that's how it, it's why terrorism works. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, I, I do feel like I, I, I'm sure I didn't really, I wasn't good enough to really do justice to all of the ideas that I had, but the ideas, and my books are very different from each other, but these particular ideas run through all of them, and it, it really did start there. And, and even little things like doubling and doppelgangers, you know, the, the sister who, there's, it's about two sisters who look very similar. The younger one comes of age in the late 70s. She idealizes her older sister who died under mysterious circumstances uh, in, in 1970, having been very much in the counterculture. So even that, that sort of doubling that kind of longing towards some sort of idealized version of the self, the way in which media um, suggests some of that experience. Um, I mean, it's a lot of how advertising works. It sort of presents us with a, a dreamscape, an image world that we want to converge with. And I mean, my, my thoughts were even grander than that because what I was ultimately, the, the name of the older sister who has vanished is Faith. Probably might not do that again if I uh, <laughs> were reconceiving of this story, but what I really was fundamentally interested in were the ways in which all of this is a, um, a kind of re-experiencing uh, re of the longing for transcendence, which I think is a very basic human longing. And so that time represents a kind of transcendence for the characters a transcendence they didn't ex have. Yeah, in, it, in the mediated form that it, in which it, it now exists, and to some extent existed even then. And that's sort of what Todd Gitlin's book is so interesting um, about. That the, He suggests, for example, that the counterculture was never nearly as large as anyone thought. I mean, you know, there were periods where there was a fear of some kind of revolution that was laughable. I mean, these numbers were really small, but because no one quite understood how mass media worked, they thought, you know, they, they, it looked like they were everywhere. Um, you know, it's sort of like the earthquake in San Francisco in 89. You, all you saw were the scenes of destruction, of course, because those make the best pictures. I mean, this is how it works. The impression was that the entire city was in rubble. That was far from the case. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I, 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 I'm, I'm very interested in the ways in which, uh, in our relatively secular culture, this longing for transcendence finds its expression in our relationship to mass media. The question of nostalgia, uh, a longing for a time you missed, or a time that you were present for, which you feel like you weren't present for. You somehow missed it even though you were there. So listen to this from Jennifer's novel. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Phoebe is the younger sister and she's just met a, a, an attractive guy called Kyle who her sister dated. Phoebe looked at Kyle, miles away at the couch. It was always this way, something she needed to remember, pulling her back like an undertow. A white door sealing her off, reminding Phoebe that her present life was unreal and without significance. What matter was hidden from sight. At times she hated remembering, wanted nothing in the world but to rush forward into something of her own, lose herself in. But this wasn't possible. The only way forward was through that door. Do you miss her, Phoebe said into the silence. Kyle groaned from up from the couch and sprayed water on the leaves of several spindly marijuana plants leaning toward an ultraviolet love bulb. <laughs> Delicate threads tied them to stakes. Sometimes I feel like she's still back there, he said, in that time. I miss it like hell. Me too, Phoebe said, an ache in her chest, even if I wasn't really there. Sure you were there. No, I was a kid. There was a long pause. I wasn't there either. Kyle said, not totally. What do you mean? 
I kept circling, circling, but I never quite hit it. This admission made Phoebe uneasy. You were there, Kyle, she assured him. You were definitely there. <laughs> so this question of, 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 of temporality, of a, of a time one missed or was present for, but the question of thereness, your characters talk about hitting it. You know, Faith, the older sister, she wants to hit it. She wants to be at the center of the 60s and goes all the way to Germany to meet Ulrike Meinhof of the Red Army faction and then becomes part of a secondary terrorist group. I think the June 2nd movement, one of those, and ends up um, lighting a bomb and killing a guy. All because she wants to be, she wants to hit it. That's the phrase they use. So it's very much about presence and transcendence, a presence that is transcendent, if you will. And also about how, in a way, we define uh, that, that part of what makes these goals seem exciting is the very fact that they can't quite be achieved, that, that part of the longing for transcendence is the uh, inherent impossibility of achieving it. And the relentless effort to do so, at least in, in this story, is what seems to create that turn from, from longing into abuse, let's say, whether it's a, you know, a, a, a political movement or drug use, um, that that sort of relentless wish to cross a distance that, that can't be crossed um, by definition is what ends up being destructive. Turning to your other series, the second series on me of small wars. Uh, could you tell us, not everyone will know the project, um, about the project and how it came about. And so here you have mnemonic return, but you're not going to the place where things happened. There's a displacement that allows return to occur, if you will. What well, this, this project is in a way so absurd. Um, I, I think after traveling to Vietnam and photographing there, and um, I think you would notice that some of the later work from Vietnam are more ambiguous. That's when the picture of the kites happen. That's when pictures that could be taken for moments of war were made. Uh, I, I think I, I knew I was coming to an end, and, and the issue to deal with was the actual war, which I felt I had ignored. Um, and I heard about this young man who reenacted the Vietnam War in the United States. Um, and, and I think being somebody who likes to work in the, with the real world with something happening, I thought that there could be a, a great potential for a new project there. So um, I found a group um, who reenacted the Vietnam War, uh, the closest to New York. Uh, they were doing it in Virginia. And it was all by invitation, and I got myself invited. And the um, condition was that I, I needed to um, participate as well. Um, and I was given a choice. You could be um, a Viet Cong, you could be a, a, um, a doctor, you could be a photographer. And I basically asked them, well, what role would give me the most flexibility? And they said, well, you should be a Viet Cong who's captured, and then you can go on the other side. I said, <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, um, and, and, and so I, I, you know, just like many of my projects, I didn't know what I was going to find, how this would end up, but I decided to go. Um, and, and these are very um, conservative young men. Some of them may have been in the military. It, it, it's, you know, you couldn't really double check anybody's personal history. You know, they, they came up with all sorts of um, backgrounds. Um, they may have been in the military, but always uh, in side job, never in combat. They may have been drivers or they may have been worked in the office. Um, but I think they felt that they missed something and perhaps they had a, a, an older brother who distinguished themselves in, in Vietnam or they missed a calling in the military and so they joined this group. Um, they, they grew up you know, fascinated with Vietnam War era uh, paraphernalia, they wanted to be able to use it, they wanted to meet other people who did it uh, and they came together. It's a group of 50 guys um, and, and uh, um, it was quite strange because, uh, you know, it was 
quite difficult to be invited. And as soon as I arrived, I realized that I was the most authentic thing they had besides the AK-47. <laughs> and, and, they, and they actually used me in many of their scenarios because, you know, it was a matter of pride to make something that was exciting. So they concocted, you know, incredible things. You would be in the VC camp and jump out of the uh, uh, rice jar and, uh, you know, it, it was... Um, but I think ultimately, once I got over all of that, you know, I, I realized that this was really important work because it said so much about the way uh, Americans had not completely processed the aftermath of the war. Um, Americans didn't really understand what Vietnam was all about, and, and there was this myth that was perpetuated, not just about the war, but also about what Vietnam actually is as a country. Um, and so I felt I could study uh, a lot of that through them. And we sort of came together and created these pictures. And, and it, you know, there was a lot of push and pull. You know, at first I thought, God, these pictures don't come anywhere close to uh, suggesting uh, the, the seriousness and the intensity of the war. But it was not about that. Um, so I think... They're pine trees, which... Yeah, they, they, brought, they brought bamboo. They, they, they really... And, and you know, I... I I finally realized what they were after. They were after a kind of authentic moment that they would experience at some point during the reenactment, whether it was to see me in a black pajamas with a, a, a machine gun, or whether it was patrolling and then feeling the breeze you know, on their face. Um, so it, it was very difficult, um, but I think it, for me, it, it was uh, very rewarding because I think that I started thinking about various issues, uh, a lot of my misgivings about the war. This idea of the enemy, who is the enemy? You know, is it the GI? But, you know, they actually saved me and airlifted me out of Vietnam. Or is it the Viet Cong, you know, that came and completely destroyed South Vietnam and uh, the war was so devastating. So thinking about the idea of the enemy, thinking about uh, um, the other, you know, so, so it, it, it was a kind of cathartic. Well, you, you say, um, you credit the men you worked with that, in a sense, you write, we were all artists working through yeah. things. Yeah. I mean, these sorts of reenactors are not considered artists, and the, reenact the other reenactments, Mary Kelly and so on, that's considered art. And what's so fascinating about this project is you entered this other domain, and you make art about it, and you are crediting them as producers of something. Yeah, I, I think that um, for me, it, it's always important to experience something new. And um, I'm sure that making a movie or bringing reenactors to, you know, men and women to reenact something for you is an interesting experience. But I really wanted to sort of go somewhere new and, and uh, experience another culture. Um, and so it was important that uh, I kind of slipped in and, and participated and collaborated with them. Uh, I think there's so many layers to this whole project that made it interesting. And uh, um, I think I kind of embraced uh, all of it. So before we um, open things up to the floor, anything, any points that you or are, are you would like to make or questions or anything? I mean, I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, talking about these reenactments, you know, I, I guess I'm wanting to even understand a little more, like, is, uh, two questions. One is, what, are they actually reenacting specific battles or are they sort of improvising with the tools? And the second thing is, to what degree is it entertainment? How would you characterize what they're doing? Well, there was, there's not an audience, first of all. And um, the themes for the reenactments were not specific things. Like, there was no such thing as the Malay Massacre, or the, they, they were more general um, activities, you know, a long patrol, uh, long reconnaissance patrol actions, and uh, there were special ops uh, activities, and um, so it was very general. Um, what was surprising, and I think I had a lot of misgivings walk into something like that, um, you know, how do they view each other? And, and the guys who played the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese Army guys, 
you know, we're viewed with uh, incredible respect by the GIs and vice versa. You know, the reason why one chose to be uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese or Americans had to do more with uh, the economics. You know, it cost more to have uh, the GI outfit and the guns and the M16 versus uh, being a Viet Cong. And usually the, the, the Vietnamese were more fit. You know, they're the ones who slept in the grass and, and climbed up and, and, and uh, did, um, uh, you know, so a, a lot of the patrol work. And the Americans were kind of sitting at the top of the, the base. So um, there was nothing as cringy as you would think that there could possibly be. But it was still very strange and very subversive, I thought. Um, I think there were moments when, for example, um, I would be with the Viet Cong and we were like attacking the base. And one of the Vietnamese told me, okay, yell something in Vietnamese. So I yelled something in Vietnamese and the GI yelled back, kill that bitch. And so, you know, I think, you know, for a second I was, I was in shock and where am I, you know? Uh, and of course the GI spent the rest of the weekend apologizing. <laughs> but but it, it, it sort of brought something real and maybe that was a moment that I was looking for as well. Yeah. And uh, that brought, the, I think, the intensity and the, um, the controversial, uh, it, it was difficult at times. But, but somehow I always felt that you have to go through something difficult to get to the other side, to perhaps have a glimpse of, of uh, some kind of clarity. Mm. And I just, this, this is sort of unrelated, but I, I keep, this keeps coming into my head, so I'm just gonna say it. It sort of brings to mind the whole, a whole um, the sort of role-playing game fixation that our culture has right now. Um, and one of my kids has been really involved in that, and so I've a few times gone to this place called Night Realms, which is at, at a former Girl Scout camp in New Jersey where people from all walks of life go and play these fantasy characters and you have to always be in character so you might be a, I don't know, a, a clerk in your life but you are a sort of lord with this particular history at, in Night Realms and, and there's a lot of consistency among the characters and what my son has done is, um, because he's a non-character, an NPC um, and he's, his job is to basically be part of ga uh, gangs of monsters who are out in these woods, and it's all about sort of enacting these battles between the characters and the, and the various kinds of monsters. And this is a, a real, a very compelling sort of almost way of life um, for people who are really into it, and they spend a lot of money, you know, getting, you are mentioning, you know, the equipment, the, sort of buying these objects that fit into their characters, and living this other life, this kind of parallel fantasy life, um, one weekend a month. So, I don't know, I just thought no, I would mention no, that. I, I think it's an, a possibility to bring in, to, to, for people to have a richer life, to, we were talking about it earlier, a kind of self, aggrandization of, of themselves and uh, um, I think it's really important for a lot of people. And, the, and sort of seeking this kind of real experience, I mean to me that's another another example of what I guess in, in the novel I, the characters were calling hitting it, that sort of trying to merge with some feeling of intensity or authenticity, I mean as a culture, we're pretty obsessed with authenticity, um, which, which again, I think is a lot the result of this feeling of experience being so mediated. And then a lot of what mass media tries to provide is satisfactions to that longing for authenticity in the form of things like reality TV. Um, and if you even look at our current president, a lot of what is very compelling about him for his followers is this feeling that he is authentic. He actually just Set, you know, he's, he's always the same, um, he, he's, he's unscripted. That, that feeling that he is authentic is a huge part of his power to those who, who like him. But do you think that um, feeling that something is authentic is, is mostly emotional more than analytical? That's a good question. I think it probably is mostly emotional. That would be my guess. Although, I don't know. I mean, the kind of reenactments you're talking about, the, the, the sense of the equipment being correct and the sort of 
focus on, on gear and, and historical detail, that is pretty analytical, actually. The sense that you get, you get closer by having all the, all the little elements in place. So it's a kind of relationship between the two. Um, a lot of vets that I've spoken to, you know, who speak about the war and their experience and being able to adapt to normal civilian life again, I think one of the main difficulty is that um, during war, uh, they felt that uh, they felt uh, that they they were the best of themselves, and somehow the war brought that out. And, and I think it, it's coming back to civilian life was, uh, is very difficult because they felt diminished. Um, and, and, and I think that's something that's interesting too, except that you know, we're not playing games here, we're talking about um, going to war. I mean, my view of the, the 60s, the quote unquote 60s, is a very dialectical one. And um, that authenticity is tethered to mediation. And, um, and delay and longing. So you had that bean in Golden Gate Park and then those beans were copied around the country because everyone wanted to hit it, wanted to be there, to be in the bean. Um, but of course the bean, when they wrote about the bean, I read accounts of the bean, um, it was referring to previous moments of belonging and utopias. Um, um, previous sort of utopic communities. And so the 60s was longing for an authenticity too that, they, that was imagined to have preceded it. And also a revolutionary um, ethos going back to the revolution of 1789 that you know, we think of the 60s as this period of, of revolution and we look at it as the last revolutionary moment, the kind of the last moment when there was this dream that you could change the whole world. And so it has this particular force for us but I found in my research that the 60s was always remembering previous moments of authenticity and of radical change. So, for example, the, the Felix Gamelin work, you know, is going back to an iconography of the French Revolution and uh, the famous painting by Delacroix of liberty leading the people. That, so this, this dream of, of authenticity and changing the world, of being new, is an old and modern one. And that for me, the 60s is the memory of that modernity, that um, dream of changing everything, of, 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 of being authentically new. Not just authentic, but authentically new. When you draw a character, I'm sorry, um, what adjectives do you have in mind in terms of creating a character that is convincing? Does the word authentic come into? Never. Never. <laughs> I mean, I think authenticity is, is it already presupposes mediation. Um, no, I mean, I, I write very spontaneously, at least with my first drafts. I, I start with kind of a time and a place and let the people sort of come out of that. So I, it, it has much more feeling of discovery than creation. Um, I think that the things I'm often looking for, probably two things. One is just habits of mind, the individual ways that people organize their own experience. Um, you know, of course, we never really know. We're very isolated in our own consciousnesses. And the fun of fiction for me, both as a reader and a writer, is that it's the only experience that actually puts you inside the consciousness of someone else. Anything image-based is, is, by definition, not doing that. Um, so I feel like if that's the if that's the job you have to deliver, you know, how does the world look? And so the first question is always just how people organize their reality. Um, and then the second thing I'm always interested in is the way in ways in which people don't make sense, the contradiction, sort of the opposite of the consistent character, who I would say is more of a, I mean, that's really a kind of generic approach to fiction. Um, and so I'm always interested in how. The, the things about people actually are almost irreconcilable, how people's traits actually don't make sense. Those are kind of the, the things I think, but I think we might have some questions. Is that true? I thought you were giving me a significant look there. I saw a hand in the back. <laughs> there's one here too. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm interested in any of your thoughts on, on the human corporeality. How are we returning in our physical bodies? 
whether it's reenactments, virtual realities, you know, what, whatever it is. Is there something there or is it impossible? I don't know if I totally understand the question. Do you mean, how do we, yeah, can you explain, or maybe you guys understand. I just wanna understand a little bit better. Well, like, I, it, it could be seen um, in terms of biopower, and that would be through institutions and municipalities and how they affect how we move together as people and then it could also be seen simply as expressions of, of human action, whether it's individual or in, in mass. I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm feeling dense. I'm not... I, um, I mean, one, one, one issue, I don't think this at all addresses what you're saying, but one issue is in the practice of return is the, the body, the corporeal body is often involved in the return. Um, return can be strictly mnemonic, consulting your own memories, or it can mean going all the way to Vietnam with your own body and walking that land and, and taking photographs. Your work your work on me necessitates a corporeality, your own body that sets up the camera um, and, and takes the shot um, in real time. Um, so there are, the, within this particular framework, in this particular book, um, return can be very corporeal and it can be very, very imaginative, just in your own mind. Actually, I'll just say one more thing about that, which is I, I, I think it's, um, I love that so many of these images you show involve actually returning to physical places, like one's own body in a physical space is a very powerful thing. And again, I think in, the, in a world that feels so virtual in so many ways, there's really no substitute for just standing in a place or walking in a place and feeling the elements of that place. And, and thinking about the history of that place is very different from um, while actually being there from doing it sort of in, in the abstract. So for me personally, as, as someone who's, my portal into fiction is actually a time and a place above all else. Um, with the Invisible Circus, um, it was that it was San Francisco in the 70s in its imbued with that nostalgia. Um, so I, for me, sort of the physical body in a physical place is kind of where it all starts, actually. Um. Hi, excellent panel. Thank you for everything. Really interesting thoughts. Um, <clears throat> I am also fascinated by um, nostalgia. I've done some research on it. And uh, you know, one of the things that's very interesting is that it really, uh, if you trace the words popularity back in time, it actually really matches up almost exactly to the Industrial Revolution and the flight from country to city. And so it's really interesting because it sort of talks about what you uh, were talking about, corporeality, about, I mean, and the word nostalgia is really about pain, right? Alja, like neuralgia, and nost, which is a return to home. And so I think it's interesting that we have this, this, uh, this, what I find fascinating about nostalgia is that it specifically seems to uh, look back, yes, to authentic authenticity, but I think it's also about safety and security. I think that's a big part of it, which makes your 60s thing, like, it's interesting since we're talking about, you know, oh, I have such nostalgia for Kent State, you know, like, oh, yeah, I wish I was there. But no, um, but I think it's interesting because you have the two kind of political uh, takes on the 60s, as you were talking about, Democrat and Republican. But, you know, yeah, I do have, I was born in the 60s, I have intense nostalgia for the 60s. And um, I mean, I don't analyze it that much because I don't want to. But I guess if you guys had to really um, define what you, your 
what you think nostalgia is in 25 words or less, you know, how would you do that? Well, think, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think the return home is not necessarily comfortable. You know, uh, return home for me was to try to um, look at formative experiences or confronting the past or confronting where you came from and how you came to be who you are. So I think it can be very painful. Um, so maybe, you know, you lured by the idea of comfort, but I think ultimately if uh, you need to look past that and, and, and to do any kind of work, uh, you probably need to look at the more painful stuff. I think, I think part of it is that the landscape of childhood, painful or pleasant or both, is, is inherently, it becomes mythic in some way. Like I think about books I looked at as a kid, and those landscapes really feel like um, somehow the, these sort of mythic landscapes. And so I, I think part of nostalgia is a, a longing toward a, this ch a charged atmosphere that feels profoundly meaningful because of its place in our life and our distance from it um, that that is becomes harder and harder to replicate with time I mean as any middle-aged person knows time starts to go really fast so those early years it, 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 you know, with when when um, the landscape, and relationships were saturated with this kind of intensity, at least in memory, um, are sort of become a kind of pole star uh, toward which we, around which we, we move for the rest of our lives. One last question. Running out of time. Go ahead. Yes. Well, Jennifer, um, I think, yeah, I think I heard you say that the image, by definition, you're not inside of another's consciousness. But, but let me just say, and then it relates to, to James, for those of us who write about art, or even look at art very close, we're very interested in the consciousness expressed in the art. I, I think I misspoke. What I meant was, for example, um, it, a char if, um, thinking about character in a film, you're looking at that person and listening to what they say, but you're not inside their consciousnesses in the way that you would be in it from in a narrative, um, a written narrative. No, I would not include um, no. okay, the fine arts. Okay, let me great, great. Now, James, what is it about Smithson's consciousness that appeals to you? What do you mean by Smithson's consciousness? Well, there must be some, I mean, I mean his, his being, you wrote, you wrote the second half of your book on Smithson, his beingness, I mean, it's not just his work, it's his attitudes, you know, it's, you're drawn to him. Okay, why are you drawn to Smithson? One could ask the same thing about, from you, because you're writing a book on Smithson, too. <laughs> um, Mm. But you're not. But you're also asking why I'm drawn, which is a, a, a very generous uh, thing to ask. Um, uh, he has a fabulously capacious mind. It is his consciousness and the fact that he's able to embrace so many fields and disciplines, that he was an autodidact, not formally educated, and not constrained like so many of us by a disciplinary uh, parameter. And that when you read his writings or look at his, his work, as Carl Andre once said to me, it's sort of inexhaustible. And yet it kind of holds together. And so there's entropy, there's monumentality, which is the dialectic in his first article, which frames my whole discussion in the second part of the book. Um, there's his practice, the non-sight, the sight, which is a dialectical model which would prove so useful for thinking about the 60s. The Sam Durant work is the good and the bad is a kind of manichaeistic reinflection of, of the sight and the non-sight in Durant's work. 
I could go on and on and on, but it's just so capacious and generous. He invites us all in um, to occupy different parts of his work. It's not closed, it's not tautological, uh, like a Joseph Kossuth, for example. It's broad and, and inviting, so that's, that's it. But in this book, um, I also grapple with the fact that I didn't, miss, didn't meet him, and some of the people in this room did. Um, well, you're sitting behind, you're sitting behind uh, Hans and Linda Hocke, who really did know him very well. Um, and so that adds a whole other layer, as it does with Eva Hess and other figures who I missed. So there's a kind of melancholia. We're talking about different types of memory and emotion. We talked about nostalgia. Perhaps there's a kind of melancholia at play in my desire to have met these people I missed. And the analogy I use in the book is Henry James's novella, The Aspirin Papers, which is all about a young scholar who uh, is fascinated by a romantic poet called Aspirin who died before he could meet him. And his whole, the whole drama of the, the novella is about the attempt to know somebody you never knew, could never, ever know. So James's novella is a major framing device for my engagement with Smithson and, and missing him. But I could have also done such a, a text about Eva Hess. I sure wish I had known Eva Hess. So that, that's a kind of response. Why stop there? How about Rembrandt? <laughs> well, but Rembrandt, you see, I couldn't, I mean, it was so far away, and yet when I was in my 20s, I met people who really knew Smithson and knew Eva Hess. My friend Amy sitting right here, her mother was very close to Eva Hess, and Linda and Hans were very close to Eva Hess. So it's that. I'm very interested in what I call recentness and, and, and a past that you can sort of touch, but you can't quite reach. I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs>